right. Uh, so the topic of today's uh, presentation and, and live demo section is battery-free IoT sensors. So in about a half hour, I'm going to take you through a little bit about what our company does. We're actually going to see some real sensors here uh, powering themselves or, or powering themselves with harvested energy uh, live on the desktop here in my little lab. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about why our customers love us and kind of how we brought this technology into the world. So uh, that's our agenda here for today. I want to be respectful of your time, so we're going to try to exit right at 30 minutes. Uh, but I will include contact information at the end. Uh, so if you have follow-up questions, we can get connected. So, all right. And I see a hi from Costa Rica already. Hi, Luis, thanks for joining us. Okay, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Peter Woodman. I'm the principal sales engineer here at EverActive. I've actually been with the company since before we put our first product out on the market. So it's been really fun to see this new concept of uh, battery-less self-powered sensors go from an idea onto something that uh, you can hold in your hands and, and we've delivered out to, to customer sites and reproduced thousands of times. So it's been really, really fun. Uh, exciting journey. Thanks for joining us today to talk a little bit about it. First, I wanna talk a little bit about batteries though and why batteries are, are not a great idea for the internet of things in general. Uh, there's a big human cost. Uh, we've been all over industrial environments around the world in our company. Uh, we've met you know, thousands of people who work in these environments and I've never met somebody with the title battery changer. So if you add a battery to a piece of equipment at your facility, you've now made a commitment that someone's gonna to have to go back and visit that sensor to replace the battery. Uh, usually that's you know, gonna require a trip you made all on its own. Uh, you could go and, and pull a battery out while you're already out there, but then you're gonna sacrifice some of the energy that's in there. So it's a wasteful thing to do. Uh, particularly in industrial environments with our customers there, uh, the people who are doing this are maintenance professionals. They're really highly trained. They could be doing better things than changing batteries. You're stealing cycles from their job uh, to get them to go out and, and do this. So it's a, it's a wasteful thing from a time standpoint. Uh, maintenance planners have to make sure you have these parts in stock, schedule the actual replacements and do some things with the batteries that come back out. Uh, so, you know, across the board, uh, there's a, a big human cost here in adopting battery powered sensors around your environments. Uh, but there are other costs too. Uh, and uh, trade-offs, I should say, uh, in terms of what you get back. So because of all the things we just mentioned, we see uh, in many environments, people are instrumenting fewer things than they'd like to. Maybe the top five or 10% of their facility is getting a battery powered sensor because they know they're gonna have to go back and do maintenance uh, and, and visit those sensors again. Uh, but the sensors themselves have trade-offs in them. They ration how much data they transmit in order to uh, you know, milk that battery and make it last as long as possible. So you're getting fewer insights than you could We've seen that uh, with many of the pieces of equipment around industrial and manufacturing facilities, uh, that if you're not getting continuous data, you can miss important things. Uh, so you're being asked to get by with the minimum amount of data uh, to run your facility instead of the maximum amount of data. Some people may say that, well, some data is better than no data. Uh, they haven't had a choice until now. They've had to deal with what they can get from a battery powered sensor that transmits a couple times an hour to a couple times a day. But we have uh, designed a better way here at EverActive, a different way to think about this. Uh, and that's uh, sensors that are powered completely by harvested energy. So let's take a look at what it means to be batteryless. There are five sources of energy that we can harvest from with our sensors. Uh, they're outlined here on the right side of this slide. The two most plentiful in the applications we have out today are temperature differential, so something that's warmer than something else, uh, or the presence of light. So these are the two I'll, I'll show you, you know, the harvesters we have for today. Um, in the case of our first product, it was for steam systems and steam trap monitoring. You know in a steam system, you're gonna have a hot pipe. So we take that uh, heat that's radiating off the pipe already. We scavenge that waste heat and turn it into electricity. And there's enough energy there for us to power our sensor and have it run uh, perpetually. Uh, in the case of the machine health monitor, our second product, which I also have one uh, to show you here today, uh, there are some times where a motor or a piece of driven equipment is warm and sometimes where it may not be. So we've added a second harvester there uh, to harvest light. And that could be LEDs or CFLs like the room you're sitting in now uh, or our traditional incandescent bulb. Uh, but it could also be outdoor light like the sun. Outdoor light, you know, that uh, energy from the sun, IR light in particular is a very plentiful source of energy for us. Uh, so uh, that's another great way to run our sensors. If you think about something like a, a motor that's in a dark room and it runs very close to ambient temperature so we don't have temperature differential, uh, the next harvester we're working on is for electromagnetic fields. Uh, so if you have an electric powered motor, it's gonna throw off a lot of EMF. 
and harvesting that, scavenging it, and using that energy to power our sensor is next on our roadmap. So there are other ways you can harvest energy too, like RF uh, or vibration. Uh, these are less plentiful. Uh, so uh, those are things we've been working on. Uh, we're, we're not shipping a product that uses either of those harving me methodologies yet, uh, but it's something uh, we see down the road as a, another way to help uh, keep these sensors going without having to be reliant upon something like a battery. All this technology was spun out of university research. Our co-founders are university professors, the University of Michigan and the University of Virginia. They met at MIT when they were getting their doctorates and then went back to their home universities to continue this research. And it's really that uh, the super low power electronics and specifically the low power radios that they designed that allow us to get away with these humble sources of energy that are already there uh, powering our sensors. So that's a little bit of an overview. Uh, we'll talk more about these individual components here in our live demo. I'm gonna stop the slides for a minute and just switch over to my camera here in the room. Uh, first thing I'm gonna show you is a steam trap. So our first product is this steam trap monitor. We won't dwell too long on these, but just know that this is what it looks like when it's installed you know, inside a customer environment. Uh, I've actually got a hot plate here today since I don't have a steam system. Uh, so looking here at the tabletop, you'll see we have a hot plate. It's set to 142 C. So this is warm, uh, warmer than I need it to be. Uh, we can actually power off, you know, more like 20 degrees C temperature differential or even lower than that, depending on the application. Uh, but that's what we're using here. And I'll actually track these temperatures. So keep that in mind. We'll see it in our dashboard in a minute. So sitting on top of this hot plate are two of our energy harvesters. These are for uh, thermoelectric generation. So they take heat and turn it into electricity. I'm actually going to take a cold one that hasn't been sitting on the hot plate and walk you through the individual components. So, so this aluminum is for heat transfer. Uh, in this rounded one, it's made to, made to a pipe for steam systems. You can see we have a flat one too uh, for motors. Uh, and then uh, these fins are for heat dissipation. It's actually a difference in temperature that allows this device to uh, produce electricity. So if you look at the core here, it looks kind of like a scrabble tile. That's called a Peltier device. It's two pieces of dissimilar metal. If one is warmer than the other, then it starts to emit a trace amount of electrical current down this wire. Not very much electrical current. I'm gonna give you a point of reference. I'm wearing an Apple watch here. This is considered to be one of the most power efficient consumer electronics available in the world. Uh, and three of the big four consumers of energy on this device are radios. Uh, LTE is the big one, Wi-Fi, uh, there's a screen, that's the third biggest consumer. And then Bluetooth Low Energy is number four for the device, number three among the radios. Bluetooth Low Energy is considered to be an ultra efficient uh, radio. It runs at about 50 microwatts. And the way it gets away with that is it turns itself off most of the time and then fires on in little blips for fractions of a second to transmit data back and forth. So by shutting itself off, it can hit 50 microwatts. Uh, the Evernet radio we have that's in this steam trap monitor that's always on, always listening, runs with a power budget of 200 nanowatts. So it's a thousand times lower than BLE. And that's what allows us to use a small energy harvester like this. If I plugged this into my watch, it wouldn't even boot. You couldn't charge a phone or anything like that. Uh, an energy harvester to do that would be many, many, many times larger and need much, much hotter uh, inputs in order to generate that kind of electricity. So, so that's kind of the core IP that allows us to do this, uh, you know, almost magic radio uh, so low in its energy consumption. Uh, so uh, this thermoelectric generator is one of you know, several different styles that we make. Uh, there are also some thermistors that are here on this harness. And you can see they're color coded red and blue for the inlet and outlet side of the assets that they mate to. Uh, and then a plug that goes into our sensor. So this is the sensor pack itself. Um, this is our first gen product. Uh, the uh, little cube you see up there in the upper right hand corner is our second gen product, our machine health monitor. Uh, so the thermoelectric generator for that looks a lot like the steam one. Same Peltier device in the middle, uh, but flat here with some stabilizing arms uh, to mate to things like motors. And I should note that these are magnetic, so you can stick them on metal uh, and they mount that way. You don't have to necessarily epoxy them down. Our second gen platform also uses um, USB-C connectors. So they're uh, rubber gaskets in there and screws to keep them from being uh, disconnected accidentally. Uh, but this is a, a more standards-based cable and it's modular, which means we can use a bunch of different lengths. So I'm using a, a longish cable here, uh, but we also make these in a bunch of different sizes depending on your application. So here's a shorter one. You may see some little blips coming off this steam trap monitor and that machine health monitor up there. Uh, they're reporting back to our gateway anytime you see one of those flashes. So we'll uh, take a look at those data points here in a minute. 
one other thing I wanted to show you while we're in this view though is our harvester. So this is a solar harvester. Uh, it daisy chains down from the, um, the tag. So you can see there's a port there an open USB-C port and one here. So we can use those modular cables to connect these and then run this to somewhere where we can get daylight uh, or indoor light. So it's magnetic. So let's stick it right there and you'll see it. Okay, so that's what's going on on the tabletop demo. Uh, just the heat of this hot plate powering these thermoelectric generators and that's what's keeping our, our sensors running. Now, when we take a look at the data, you'll notice that there are times where I've turned this temperature down. Like last night when I went to sleep, I turned the hot plate off so I didn't have something running so hot last night. That is uh, important to note that the sensors didn't go off. Uh, you can actually you know, turn the heat all the way off and these sensors will continue to run for hours at a time. Uh, we don't use batteries to do that because even rechargeable batteries have a limited number of cycles before they wear out. But we do have banks of supercapacitors inside our sensors. So we can do some energy storage. So if you have a process or a harvesting method that's only available part of the time, uh, you know, while heat is there or while light is there, we'll fill those supercapacitor banks and then we can coast for long periods of time. So if the thing that you're monitoring shuts off, we can tell you. We can say, hey, wait a minute, it's not generating heat anymore. Uh, you know, please go check on it or, or the thing that you're measuring. So in the case of the steam trap monitor, we're measuring temperature. So I have my probes here and we'll see the output of that. The machine health monitor is driven primarily in an accelerometer. Uh, so not a lot of accelerometer data to be had here, just stuck to my pipe. Uh, so we'll take a look at this temp data and I'll show you some trends here. All right, back to our screen share. I'm going to move out of our, um, our slide deck for a moment. Where are we? Thanks for bearing with me. And here's a, a view of that same sensor we were looking at in our cloud platform. I'm going to hit update here. And you'll see this data draw. And these are measurements that have taken since we started our, our webinar. So oh, I'm set to AM. That's okay, it's set to PM, we'll get our data, there we go. All right, so each measurement we've taken here is in our cloud platform, streaming as we go. Um, I'm rounding these off with a five minute down sample right now because we're gonna look at a, a couple days worth of data, but we could actually show every measurement down to the minute. So here in our software, we have graphs and you can roll over each individual measurement to see what it was at that time. Uh, we also have a suite of analytics, you know, algorithms that run in the cloud. So for something like a steam trap where the behavior has to be learned, uh, we train on it, and then when there's a, a change, like a failure, uh, we send you a notification. Uh, but if you want to inspect it yourself, we make all that data available to you. Uh, so if there's something like this curve last night, you can see when I went to bed, uh, I shut off the hot plate, and you can see these temperatures dipping down. So this green line is the uh, steam supply side. It's that red tag that's on the harness we looked at. This navy blue line is the outlet side. That's the blue tag line. Uh, on a harness we just looked at. And then this ambient actually comes from the sensor pack itself. Uh, so we can give an, an ambient temperature measurement in the room. Uh, typically in a steam application, that sensor is on an insulated stretch of pipe or strut nearby. Uh, so it's not, um, it's not exposed directly to the heat. So that's how we can uh, determine kind of what your ambient temperature in the room is. You know, when there's failures, uh, we can call those, attention to those with our notifications. Uh, they are here in the dashboard, but we also can send emails and, and text message out to get you that data. So take a look at our peaks and valleys here since today as uh, playing around with our hot plate a little so we'd have some data to look at up and down. So we keep all these temperature measurements available online. Uh, so you can go and, and see them at any point. And for example, if you have a piece of equipment and you wanna see how it was behaving a week ago, a month ago, even a year ago, we keep every measurement we've ever taken available there for you on the web platform. Uh, we don't like nickel and dime you to go back further in time or delete it after a certain amount of time. Because uh, it's actually really valuable to be able to say, hey, you know, I, we know this asset, or we know its history now, we can look back and see when it was under different loads or, you know, uh, in the same exact behavior it's exhibiting now, what did it look like a year ago? Uh, that can be really valuable to engineers who are troubleshooting the equipment. So. We also store a lot of metadata. Um, you know, I, that's all up here in our cloud platform. Since I'm on a, a test unit, you know, uh, there's not a lot to report here, but if it were a piece of industrial equipment, we'd brick all that in. Uh, so before you go to do service on a failed asset, you know exactly what parts you need and what tools to take with you. 
Uh, and we put metadata in there about the location and asset tag information. Uh, so you know exactly what asset it is you have to go out and service uh, all from one digital interface. Uh, so you can go and find it really easily. All right, so that's our uh, kind of the software portion there. Uh, you can see actually that these measurements continue to march in as we go. So if I update this to our, our current time, we'll see a few additional ones have come in. I'm rounding off to five minute centers, but if we downsample to a minute, you'll see each individual measurement come and go. So, and actually, if we go back to the graphs, you'll see individual measurements in there too, right? So we can scrub in between and see exactly when I turned the hot plate on this morning at 1030. Pretty cold overnight. So one more thing I wanted to show you here, uh, actually in person, this is a sneak peek of our, our next sensor. And I wanted to do this to give you kind of an idea of where we've been and where we're headed. So this steam trap monitor, that's our first gen product, right? It's about the size of a deck of cards. Uh, and um, you know that represented a breakthrough, kind of the world's first batteryless uh, wireless sensor. Uh, form factors, kind of large. Uh, about a year later, we developed our machine health monitor. So you can see kind of the change in size. This is more like a salt shaker in size. Uh, the primary control board that runs this that sits in here is much smaller, like a two inch by two inch instead of this big deck of cards. Uh, this also brought enhanced compute capabilities with it. There's a full system on chip in here, uh, which means we can run and execute code remotely. So we can send software and firmware updates to this over the air without ever going back and flashing the firmware or something along those lines. So Gen 1, Gen 2 about a year later, uh, for the first time publicly today, I have an example of our Gen 3 sensor with me. Uh, so I'm gonna pull that out now. And this is about the size of an Oreo cookie, maybe a little bit larger than that. Fits easily in the palm of your hand. Uh, so we're bringing these to market next year. Uh, hopefully we're working on prototypes of them now. You can see integrated solar cells here on this one. Uh, and once again, just a really tiny form factor. Uh, we're working on a bunch of different sensing modalities that can connect to this device. Um, the idea here is, you know, if you shrink the form factor of these, make them easier to deploy and increase the range, which each time we've bumped up a generation of our technology, we uh, make the radios better too. So as these grow and expand, uh, you're able to enable what we call pervasive sensing, right? Uh, placing these all over your facility to unlock new data streams, things you've never thought about sensing before. Uh, we actually had an article uh, that was written up in the Wall Street Journal where they talked about our technology as smart dust. Right? You sprinkle it out there and it uh, reports back up to the cloud telling you, you know, precisely where you need to go. Uh, and like I said, unlocking new data streams that uh, maybe you hadn't thought about sensing before. So pretty neat. Uh, for one piece of comparison, I have a can of Coke here. So you can see exactly what the size of all these sensors are. Really, really small, which allows us to place them in a bunch of different places around facilities that are occupying uh, you know, a lot of um, real estate and not making you run wires everywhere like, you know, traditional uh, sensors would. So. All right, I'm going to uh, switch back to our slideshow here and talk a little bit about what's coming next for us. Right, so we looked at our, our heat and light application. Once this data starts streaming, uh, you can use it as a reference point right at the machine, right? Uh, so you don't have to bring a specialized tool with you to figure out if that motor you just walked past is behaving correctly or not. Uh, but we've also digitized it. And since we're connected through the cloud, you could be at home in your kitchen, you know, working from home and see that same data. Uh, or you could be, you know, away from work and home altogether and access it from anywhere in the world. Uh, so we think, you know, by digitizing these, these processes and, and making that data free to access all over, uh, you now have the ability to interact with this stuff regardless of where you're located. That said, uh, most of our customers are not spending a lot of time looking into these interfaces, snooping around, trying to find a problem. We have a complex analytics suite on our cloud platform uh, that calls your attention to things that are failed. So you can get an email or a text message saying, hey, there's a failure here. This is what you need to focus on. And I think this is kind of the second order is really an important point of emphasis. So instead of um, you know, thinking about uh, inspecting these facilities as something where you have to go and get the data and then go and analyze it, by taking that first tier off your plate, you never go and check on something that's good ever again. So self-powered sensors sit out there like little sentries 
waiting for a failure to occur, and then they call your attention to it. And then you can, you can respond to that input instead of having to go out and take those measurements to begin with. So it's a, a subtle difference there if you think about it, but it adds up to huge changes for our customers. Um, in fact, if we kind of look at this by the numbers, uh, we've saved over a million dollars just in wasted steam alone for our customers using the steam trap monitor. Uh, so that's a tremendous amount of savings, you know, across our fleet. Uh, and, you know, that uh, assumes that somebody was checking those steam traps before on a manual inspection route of some kind. The difference between finding them exactly when they're failed and being able to respond much quicker versus waiting until the next time a manual inspection would have occurred, uh, that's what adds up to those huge savings. Uh, but there are ecological benefits too, and we pride ourselves on those uh, at this company. Um, we've actually diverted over 110,000 tons of CO2 uh, from uh, overproduction at the boiler level. So by fixing these steam traps sooner and not having all that steam, you know, uh, blow into a condensate receiver tank or down a drain, um, we're actually helping make industry a little greener. Um, finally, you know, this may sound familiar uh, from an ecological standpoint from what we talked about at the top. We've diverted a heck of a lot of batteries from going into landfills. Uh, industrial sensors usually use batteries with heavy metals in them and they're heavily packaged, which makes them really, really difficult to recycle. Many of them don't get recycled at all. Uh, so in the time we've been out there in the world, uh, we've headed off a lot of batteries from ever having to be put out there at the edge. So uh, uh, kind of an interesting point here about energy efficiency. To date, we've gathered over 424 million data points from measurements on our sensors. We talked about the power efficiency. Essentially, these things work on like, you know, leak by current, uh, a very small source of energy. But if you sum up all those data points we've measured across all of our sensors that sit out there at the edge, we summed that electricity together, came back with a number of about a third of one kilowatt hour of electricity total across the entire fleet with those sensors at the edge, which is just a tiny amount of energy. In fact, I'm going to give you a comparative here. Uh, if you were brewing a pot of coffee, you'd use more energy than that just to brew one pot of coffee. So all the all that sensor data we've ever collected, the million plus dollars and 110,000 tons of a diverted CO2 was all powered by less than brewing a single pot of coffee on those sensors sitting out at the edge. Pretty remarkable. So think about that next time you go and grab a cup of joe. Uh, really kind of a, a radical shift uh, once you have these super high efficiency sensors. So thinking about the future, you know, last year we released that first generation sensor in that deck of cards form factor. It had about 30 meters of range between the sensor and the gateway, and it needed about a 20 degrees Celsius delta, you know, from what it was sensing to power on in a steam system. You're always going to have that much temperature differential in steam. So uh, that's you know uh, not a, a a big deal there. Our second gen product which came out which came out this summer. That's that machine health monitor that has the accelerometer in it and does vibration analysis. Uh, that's a, a smaller form factor like the salt shaker. A huge step up in range on our second gen Evernet radio there, uh, and a big step down in the amount of energy we consume in order to do that. Uh, not just temperature there. We can also use light. Lux is the measurement of light. The room you're in now, you know, no doubt probably has 200 lux in it. Um, even a dimly lit room is probably enough to keep that sensor running. Uh, so that's our second gen and kind of where we are today. Uh, that prototype that I snuck out and showed you uh, there that's on the desk that you can still see, that's our third gen. It's got our new radio in it. Uh, there's uh, several different applications we're looking at for that. Um, but uh, kind of the, the big breakthrough there is in the range of the radio. We're looking at, you know, about a kilometer's worth of range and the testing we've done so far with that radio off of a self-powered energy budget. Uh, really remarkable to think about that we keep taking down the requirements of uh, harvested energy and increasing the range. If you think about radios across industry, typically anytime you want to get better range, you're going to throw power at that problem. So for us to uh, be able to bring down our power requirements and increase the range is truly something no one else in the world is doing. Uh, pretty remarkable team of engineers we have here. So a couple minutes left, I do want to talk about, you know, the difference this has made for our customers. We talked about the numbers impact, but we also asked them for quotes about what they liked best and, and really love about our system. Um, one quote here from a reliability engineer at, at a plant in Indiana. Uh, this is a pet food plant. Uh, he said, we didn't have to bother my IT guy once. And he's exactly right. 95% of our installations run completely independent from customer IT. Our gateways have LTE cellular modems in them that can roam between, you know, all the major carriers in the U.S., the top four. Uh, and that means that most of the time, 
uh, the gateway, once you plug it in, just start streaming data right away. Maintenance leader at a chemical plant in Virginia said, you made installation really quick and easy on me. And uh, that's true too. We think of this as a very light lift. You don't require any specialized tools. You don't have to be an IoT expert. We're there with you to help with the install. Uh, and you can usually get data flowing within a couple of minutes uh, from the time you, you know, uh, unbox the sensors and put them on assets. Um, you know, we use thumb screws to put on the thermoelectric generator on the steam trap monitor. That's about the trickiest part. Uh, the machine health monitor, we can use magnets, so let's stick right on. Our service model reduces or removes all risk. This is from an innovation director for a, a CPG company. Um, and, you know, we have really tried to de-risk this in a couple of ways. For starters, we're with their, uh, right there with you, you know, kind of on this journey. So every part of the solution is covered by us. None of it is, you know, third party where you go and source something from an external a company and then try to integrate it together. Uh, we're there from, you know, the, the questions prior to the sale through the installation process and then afterwards uh, continuing on your journey. Uh, if you ever have a question or a feature request or need support, that all comes from one company. You'll never get caught, you know, kind of pointing fingers between companies, uh, which we see sometimes with complex IT integrations where, you know, one company owns the sensor, someone else owns the backhaul, someone else owns the, the analytics stack. And so if you, you know, you need a change that affects all those things, you're waiting, sometimes years. <laughs> so, uh, but there's another way that uh, we've removed risk. We've de-risked the financial aspects of this. Uh, since we sell our monitoring as a service, if you see at any time that it's not providing value for you, you can simply discontinue monitoring. Uh, and at that point, we have to kind of pick up our ball and go home, as I like to say. Uh, so that makes it much simpler for you. Some of these industrial sensors can be in excess of $1,000 per instrument. Not to mention the fact that the batteries aren't free. So you pay recurring costs to, uh, for the right to go out and swap out those batteries uh, and usually software maintenance costs as well. So uh, our solution comes in in kind of one flat fee that's uh, lesser than those combined. And you don't have to make that big upfront investment just to get started. Uh, you can start gathering data now, uh, ensure that it's valuable to you. And if it's not, you haven't made this huge investment in something that could take years to pay off uh, after you've seen that it's not gonna be a good fit for your environment. So those are the ways we've kind of uh, surprised and delighted our customers. Uh, I'm just going to flip the camera back over with the one minute we have remaining here uh, and kind of show you the whole solution from the top again. So sensors here, uh, including this new form factor that we're bringing out in 2021. Um, the gateway, got one out here on the side, many to one relationship between these and the sensors. Uh, we include those as part of the service. So this is the one that's actually live. You can see our green status light gathering the data from these sensors and shipping it up to our cloud. So thanks for geeking out with me here uh, today. Uh, you know, in non-COVID times, we'd love to do demonstrations like this on your equipment in your facility, uh, but we, we are doing installs now and we are able to do some limited travel. So please do reach out to our team. Uh, we'd love to meet you and, and hear how we can bring this technology into your environment uh, where we can really, you know, make a change for the better uh, for your environment as well. So, all right, well, thanks again, everyone. Coming in right on time here. I'm glad I had my, my pot of coffee this morning. <laughs> a lot to fit into a half hour. If you do have any additional questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me or uh, if you're interested in, in pricing and you know, kind of next steps, please feel free to reach out to our sales team. That's sales at everactive.com. I'm part of that team as well. So if you email that group, uh, you'll get my attention there. So, okay. We're at time. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.